Will we get to a point in time where we can have changes that are predictive of, say, a heart attack or a stroke or development of cancer? Absolutely. But I think the only place where that technology is relatively near term, meaning within the next three to five years, is in cancer. We, we, we will have a preventive cancer vaccine, a preventive mRNA cancer vaccine for dogs, for dogs first, within 12 to 18 months. Wow. Welcome to the Future of Healthcare. Uh, I'm Frederick Kaufman, professor of journalism at the City University of New York and a contributing editor at Harper's Magazine. We're here to discuss some staggering developments in healthcare and the innovations ahead. We have an extraordinary panel of scientists and thinkers and experts in the complexities of healthcare. Uh, let me introduce the panel. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Jacques Sokolov. He is a uh, chairman and senior partner of SSB, a Los Angeles-based national health care management consulting and development firm. He's an entrepreneur. He's worked in a number of health policy advisory roles in the administrations of Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. Uh, welcome, Jacques. Thank we you. Also have, uh, we also have Dr. Ahmed El-Sohemi. He's the one with the, uh, the boxer in the back. <laughs> He's a professor at the uh, University of Toronto held a Canada Research Chair in Nutrigenomics. He is devoted to understanding how genetic differences modify response to diet for optimal health and performance. He's published more than 175 peer-reviewed articles, given more than 200 invited talks, and received numerous awards for excellence in research. He is the founder of Nutrigenomics Incorporated. But the brainchild uh, of this program is Ben Lytle, healthcare and business leader, visionary, entrepreneur. He's an author and a speaker whose successes include serving on presidential and state healthcare commissions, leading the health plan giant Anthem, the national expansion of the revolutionary Silver Sneaker Seniors Exercise Program, and most recently launching an innovative artificial intelligence company to increase the productivity of healthcare and other professional endeavors. He is the author of The Potentialist, a book that I just finished reading. It's an amazing book. It's about the future and what we can do to prepare ourselves to thrive in it. I think that many of us have a sense that health and healthcare are being transformed by falling birth rates, expanding life expectancy, innovations in medical science, artificial intelligence, robotics, cloud-delivered care, but Ben has told me that he believes most people today underestimate the extent and the speed with which the world is changing. We're in conversation to understand how to benefit from the changes ahead. What do we need to know about the future of healthcare? Uh, uh, first, I'd like to bring up the idea of personalization, and I'd like to bring it to you, Ben. Can you start us off? What does this mean, personalization? Yeah, I well, it's it's a it's a concept that's a, a changing everything around us, uh, uh, it, and and so it's not just healthcare. And and there's some things we can immediately identify with. Uh, uh, when when you dial in, to, when you sign on to Amazon, you it immediately pops up things you bought before, things you might like because you bought that before, things you can reorder. And that's because it knows a lot about you as a consumer. Uh, uh, when you, if you decide to watch a streaming service uh, and you and you dial up uh, uh, Netflix, same thing. It knows what you like. It get, it tends to define what you want, and you can customize it, uh, it, it to to do a lot more what you want. If you drive a Tesla, that Tesla is becoming every day your car. It is, it is learning how you drive and it's tailoring its driving ultimately to so that it can self-drive sometimes the way you, exactly you want it to drive. So one of the big changes, and, and I'm excited to hear from Jacques and Ahmed on this, but a, a, a lot of people think that, that personalization will be one of the great changes of, of the 21st century in healthcare. Uh, that not just personalization in the way we interact, like with 
you know, the examples I gave, but actually where the, the clinical interventions, the pharmaceuticals uh, and the other therapies are designed exactly, and I'm sure Dr. Ahmed will talk to us about even the food we eat will be tailored to exactly what's going to give us the best health. And that's a very exciting proposition. So Ahmed, why don't you why don't you talk about what you do because it's it's a really interesting uh, play in on on personalizations and it's and, and by the way all of these things simply weren't possible fifty years ago even thirty years ago so that's what's exciting is is we're we're moving into an era of the impossible uh, Ahmed please t- tell us a little bit about what you do sure I mean in the in the field of uh health and disease prevention, uh, when we talk about prevention, uh, nutrition is arguably one of the most important elements of that because that's something that we can control uh, on a daily basis. Uh, you are what you we, eat, right? Absolutely. That's the argument, yeah. Yeah, and and there's even a little bit of, you know, you eat what you are, meaning based on your genetics that also influences your likes and dislikes of various foods. So that whole idea of personalization applies to our food preferences, uh, but at the same time, it also applies to our biological needs, our individual genetic makeup and how we metabolize uh, various foods, supplements, and and bioactives. Uh, A classic example I think a lot of people can relate to is something like lactose intolerance, right? I mean, there's a large segment of the population that uh, can't consume lactose-containing dairy products. And when you look at the supermarket shelves now, you can see this growing number of products that are uh, labeled lactose-free. Uh, those are essentially products that have been developed for individuals based on a specific genetic alteration in a gene that affects how you process lactose. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we've done research looking at um, uh, coffee and heart disease. And, you know, there have been dozens and dozens of studies looking at this link. Results are all over the map. Some showing a protective effect, some showing no effect, some showing, you know, an increased risk. And we see this every day in the newspaper. And I think that's previously contributed to a lot of confusion among consumers and healthcare professionals, not knowing, you know, what to tell your patients. Is coffee good for you or is it bad for you? Uh, well, it turns out there's a gene for that. Uh, and uh, we reported this many years ago in uh, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, showing that if you are unable to get rid of caffeine efficiently based on a very specific genetic marker, coffee increases your risk of a heart attack. Uh, whereas if you're part of the 50% of the population that can metabolize it, it actually has the complete opposite effect. So these are just a couple of examples that you know, most people kind of relate to. Uh, yeah. But how does that, you know, it probably impacts everything that we eat. Would, and, uh, it, would your example also affect uh, uh, people who have gluten intolerance? Because that seems to be, I don't, is, it, is it growing as much as it appears to be? I mean, you used to, my mother, uh, you know, uh, uh, 30 years ago was gluten intolerant long before people knew anything about it. And she struggled with it the last 25 years of her life, really difficult. And became celiac. So, but it, but is it growing? And and is that part of what your your science is trying to address? Yeah, absolutely. Two parts there. One, it is absolutely genetic. There's a uh, alterations in the HLA genes that contribute or that are required for developing a gluten intolerance, like celiac disease. Uh, we published a paper a few years ago in the British Medical Journal showing that. Uh, in Canada, approximately 90% of cases remain undiagnosed. So despite the widespread availability of gluten-free food products, there's still a lot of people that just don't know they have celiac disease because it, it manifests in so many different ways and it's difficult to pinpoint. But uh, your point is well taken. I mean, that is an example of a kind of a condition that we used to think is genetic, but it's triggered by certain environmental factors. And in this case, it happens to be uh, gluten, which is everywhere, by the way. It's not, almost every food contains gluten. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jock, uh, I want to ha- have you uh, step in here next. Uh, you have this amazing 
uh, background where you are both uh, involved in the innovation of cutting edge uh, clinical technology, but you also work in how that ultimately gets to us through uh, health plans, doctors, and hospitals. And so I'd, I'd like you to sort of start with, uh, with where you think the big uh, changes are going to be and then, uh, and then take it from there on, 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 on how it would affect both what you see the scientific innovations coming through that are going to be huge and then also on the delivery side. Well, first of all, thank you, Ben. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And as Ben mentioned, I, I do touch uh, almost every aspect of healthcare in some fashion. And as I think to reflect on where the future is going in healthcare, I, I like to organize my thoughts in relationship to what's really happening in the clinical environment, what's happening in the business environment that supports the clinical environment, and how and how and how how and why this gets operationalized the way that it does, meaning how does the individual patient actually interact with these changes. The mega trend of personalization that you've just heard about is a manifestation of multiple, multiple smaller changes that are now becoming, I think, in aggregate understood much better as, as we just heard uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, the thing that I think is really profound, and it's something that I've just been processing in the last several years, is we're in a post-pandemic COVID endemic environment. So in other words, we, over the last several years, have gone through this huge um, stress, which was COVID. And the expansion and acceleration of mRNA technology, which everybody thought was done in a six-week period of time, uh, was done over the last 20 to 30 years. That six weeks that it took to create the, the mRNA vaccine, while correct in being very rapidly developed, it literally is like the star who was in, on Broadway for 20 years and became a movie star overnight. And they said, well, it's an overnight success. Uh, I, that person, I never saw that person. Well, you never went to Broadway. All they did was go to movies or, or whatever. mRNA has been on Broadway for 20 plus years and suddenly became the star of the show with the mRNA COVID vaccine. What that really did was two things. Number one, most of the vaccines that were thought to be futuristic, the vaccines potentially for cancer, the vaccines, if you can believe it, for potentially coronary artery disease, the vaccines for autoimmune diseases that we were just talking about. In many ways, they literally were almost all DNA vaccines, not mRNA vaccines. However, with the expansion of mRNA technology and the understanding of mRNA technology, it's becoming apparent that many, many diseases, some diseases we never thought had an inflammatory component to them, do have an inflammatory component and are really being regulated by the immune system in ways that we couldn't appreciate before. I'm sure Dr. Alassami can, can talk about that in relationship to some of the autoimmune diseases he was just mentioning, such as celiac and others. But diseases such as cancer, which we never thought we would have an immune signature for, we were gonna have an immune signature. Coronary artery diseases, which basically are blockages in the coronary arteries, also have a trigger. And we heard that word before, and I think we're gonna hear it quite a bit more. But I think the absolute profound learning from COVID it's not necessarily the mRNA vaccine for infectious disease. It's that there is an ongoing chronic low-level inflammatory process in most of us that gets triggered into some diseases that we never would have anticipated. Wow, that's fascinating. So, so we've got we've got innovations, and probably I'm guessing uh, most of the people that that are would be, are in our audience would would think. Uh, if you said, you know, big, big things coming, they would be thinking genetic, but in fact, it'll be both genetic and the immune system as, as using mRNA technology as a way to react to that. Is, is that a fair synopsis job? Yeah, that is a, that is a, that is a wonderful, very short and succinct explanation of what I just spent probably too long explaining. Okay. But at the end of the day, the immune system is proving to be substantially more participatory than I wow. think any of us thought in both the positive and negative aspects of what it does related to diseases. Wow, that's that's fantastic, Jacques. So so you, you know you're you're a you're a handicapper in a way that uh, probably many in our audience aren't in that 
you lay big bucks down <laughs> to say, as an investor and a and an entrepreneur on on what you think's going to pay off. So uh, either within the mRNA field or more broadly, wh where do you think the the big payoff is coming? Uh, it, 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 what diseases or what conditions, what innovations are going to cause the biggest amount of change? Well, I think quite candidly, this is where the model, Ben, that we talked about before, there's the clinical model, which has to be correct. And that's where the mRNA technology that I just talked about, we, for the first time, we have a direct line of sight on the inflammatory signature of these diseases using an advanced technology called mRNA peptide array technology. And, yeah. and it literally identifies the immune signature at the genomic level. So we're not looking at secondary or tertiary gene manifestations where there's a probability of disease. We're looking at actually a disease going on in a particular individual uh, at a particular point in time. I, so I, I will so in it, that, would that be in advance of in the past, even knowing you had it? I mean, is that uh, the idea? It, it, the genomic marker that is most accurate today is what's going on today. Now, okay. will we get to a point in time where we can have changes that are predictive of, say, a heart attack or a stroke or development of cancer? Absolutely. But I think the only place where that technology is relatively near term, meaning within the next three to five years, is in cancer. We, mm -hmm. we, we will have a preventive cancer vaccine, a preventive mRNA cancer vaccine for dogs, for dogs first, within 12 to 18 months. Wow. I, th I think the effectiveness of that vaccine will move the human application more rapidly than what we otherwise would have seen in a very complex and layered um, pharmaco-economic environment. But Jacques, you know, cancer cancer is, is really an umbrella term. Uh, I'm speaking just from my own layman's perspective. I mean, are you talking about a some sort of an intervention that can would cover everything from colon cancer to breast cancer to brain cancer? Yes. Uh, we basically have learned through a very large dog study, 800 dogs, the largest canine study of its type ever conducted, that we could decrease canine, the 10 most common canine cancers, which we programmed the vaccine to uh, address by close to 60% from the placebo group of the other 400 dogs that didn't receive the preventive cancer vaccine. Now, I think the more sophisticated vaccines that we will develop in the future will be very targeted. But the thing that's very remarkable about mRNA versus DNA is that it can create off-the-shelf vaccines, which means we don't need to create personalized vaccines using okay. gene editing or sequencing because the cost of an off-the-shelf vaccine is in the hundreds of dollars, the cost of a of a personalized vaccine with DNA is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So at least one company that I'm involved with is very much focused on third world types of interventions where we can treat thousands, hundreds of thousands of people for preventive to prevent cancer the way we prevent smallpox. Uh, Jock, would you mind for, for a moment? Then I want to get Ahmed's input here on on, on what what you said. Uh, what just for the for the audience? Why dogs? I mean, why dogs? Not, why not pigs, rats, something else? Why why are, why dogs? First of all, never invest in in in, in mice. That that's that's one. <laughs> anyone approach proposes an investment to you with a mouse, uh, don't don't do it. Um, mice are very different. They, you can, you can literally, re, you can re, literally repair a, a spinal sever. You can, you can sever a spinal cord and repair it with stem cells. Can't do that in any mammals that are larger than mice. Uh, I believe that one the first time I saw it. Second yeah. thing, pigs are very similar. Dogs are very similar and they're very disease specific. If you look at cardiovascular disease, we use dogs because the crossover for cardiovascular disease and human car human cardiovascular disease is 99%. There's virtually nothing that goes on in dogs that doesn't go on in humans and vice versa. Pigs are a little less specific, but they're still around 90%. The reason we use dogs for cancer, which I think will be fascinating for our audience, is that dogs get cancer five to seven times more quickly than humans do. That's because dogs age five to seven times more quickly than humans do. So as a result, rather than to wait 20 or 30 years to look at the cancer window for different kinds of cancer, 
we were able over a five-year period of time to show manifestations of all eight, of all eight to 10 of the most common cancers in dogs, which would mirror the same ones in humans. Uh, there was one cancer, which is hemangiosarcoma, which we don't get in humans anywhere near as frequently as dogs, but the rest, lung cancer, breast cancer, GI cancers are very, very similar. That's why this preventive cancer vaccine is so impactful, because if we can get this to a human um, distribution uh, within five years, we will affect the disease burden of cancer going forward because the rate of development of cancer in humans is much slower. That's fantastic. Ahmed, uh, what's your thoughts? Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're in a different field, but what's your, your thoughts as a clinician about uh, what Jock had to say? Sure. Well, actually, as a graduate student, I did my uh, thesis on uh, uh, breast and colon cancer. Oh, uh, we didn't did use okay. we didn't use mice and rats back then because those <laughs> were the models that were available. Um, and and we learned some stuff, but definitely, I agree. Over the past you know twenty thirty years, we've learned just how important the immune system is for something like cancer, right? You know, right. thirty forty years ago, most people were thinking, "What are you What are you talking about? This is cancer. This has nothing to do with the immune system." Uh, and just generalized inflammation, and the same applies to cardiovascular disease. Uh, but one area that's been uh, that I find particularly incredibly exciting because it's near and dear to me. Um, my son has a severe peanut allergy, uh, and this study that came out just a few months ago from UCLA looked at using mRNA vaccines to basically create a vaccine against peanut right. allergies uh, to wow. desensitize uh, the individual, which, and I'm very excited uh, to just see those kinds of developments. So again, just showing how you can take a technology that was developed for, you know, a particular, you know, infection, and then translating uh, that approach right. to uh, another right. application. Well, and, you know, uh, I'm just sitting here thinking, uh, you know, while uh, while the jock, you're, you're, you're the vaccines being developed, obviously, so it can be transferred to humans. For all the people who love their dogs so much, <laughs> and, you know, and there's a lot of people who really, really love their dogs. Uh, then uh, this is going to be uh, this is going to be a marvelous uh, news for them. Uh, ben, it's, it's the most common question I get: When can I get my vaccine for my dog? <laughs> and what I didn't realize, what I didn't realize, and maybe all of you who are much smarter than I am would, will know this, but during the pandemic, there were a, a, almost a million dogs added to the pet population. So the actual number of dogs wow. is 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 only on the increase. Everything related to pet health is um, is is expanding, and uh, I think it's better to be lucky than smart sometimes. But we have a lot more dogs that yep. potentially. Could benefit from this this scientific. I, I'm process. gonna I'm gonna cut us off from the 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 pet health, which <laughs> yeah. next time. And I know Ben, you you are asking the right questions, but but I got a question for you, Ben. Sure, please, sure. Uh, which is that you you said something which I found very intriguing in your in your book. If I can quote yeah, to please. you, you said healthcare today is not making us healthier. Right. Yeah, it, it it is in a way, but but we're not. It's more it's more reme, a remedial. In other words, the one thing that hasn't it, it's come a long way. Pre prevention has come a long way. Uh, uh, I when when uh, when my son uh, Hugh and I built the company that our premier product was Silver Sneakers in two thousand four, there were we we distribute that product through fitness centers. The number of fitness centers then versus now is 5X. And in Europe, places that used to, you'd go and you couldn't find a fitness center because I'm a workout freak. Uh, you, you couldn't find them. They're now everywhere. And so there's been a, a real progress that often people don't pick up on, on prevention. But we what we need is what... Uh, what uh, Jock and Ahmed are working on, where we have clinical interventions to prevent these things before, because lifestyle can only carry you so far, and we don't know enough yet, and Ahmed, you and Jock, correct me if I'm wrong, we're still early stage learning. He, human body's so complicated, and it's so different by individual. We're still learning what preventions work for some people, what diets work for some people. Uh, Ahmed's, you know, knee deep in that. So, so that's what I meant. 
the healthcare system, I'm hoping if you look at it, and and maybe Jock, you and uh, you and Ahmed could comment on this, but in some time frame, 20, 30 years, we'll look back and go, boy, we were just fixing stuff that was broke. <laughs> now we're now we're actually not letting it get broken in the first place. So that's what that's what I meant by that. So Jock uh, and Ahmed, you guys want to comment on 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 Fred's question? I thought it was terrific. Uh, and what, what, we've, what degree do you think in, you pick the decade, two decades, three decades, where we really will, will call ourselves much more of a preventative system than, than a fix it? Oh, man, you go ahead. Sure. I mean, I, the reason why I think that's so difficult to, uh, to, I guess, try to predict in terms of a timeline is because I think it goes beyond just um, technology because the technology is there. Uh, it's a matter of really it being applied and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, changing behaviors is really difficult right. to do. Absolutely. Um, we, we've actually done some clinical trials showing that if you give people DNA-based dietary recommendations and tell them this is tailored to you versus a control group that gets standard of care general recommendations – they actually are more compliant and they follow mm. the advice more because you know maybe it's an, an it's an ego thing right it's like oh this right. is for me and so i'm right. going to stick with it right. so there's a big education piece that needs to happen uh but again you know most um you know physicians are 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 again trying to treat things after they're broken and they're not really focusing enough on prevention where you know, the lifestyle changes, right? Sleep, right. exercise, meditation, diet. Right. Uh, but there is a movement, right? In lifestyle medicine and food yep. is medicine. All these uh, areas are progressing. Uh, it just needs some time before uh, there is that uh, acceptance, I think, by by the masses. Well, I, I just, uh, I just uh, started, for what it's worth, uh, uh, I just, my, my uh, son gave me for my birthday, uh, an aura ring, and I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm very. It's I am, charging. I don't know if you can yeah. see the the tan <laughs> yeah, line there, but yeah. I, I left it yeah, charging. I I, it, I am super impressed with uh, with what that uh, ring can do, and even more so in many ways than the Apple Watch because it, it's 24 seven, and it, you know, and 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 over time. I mean, we're not, we're a long way from there yet, but you give that a few decades of being able to capture really every, a lot of stuff going on in the, in the body, 24-7, 365 for years. We got longitudinal data in healthcare that we always dreamed of. You know, we'll have to have tools to, to analyze it and make sense out of it, but yeah, that's that's great. Uh, Jock, uh, what do you- I was, I was going to say, Ben, you've been focused on prevention for as long as I've known you, which is more years than we'll comment. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is that if you look at this from a macro standpoint, about 30 to 40 percent of the population dies of cancer. About 30 to 40 percent of the population dies of cardiovascular or cerebrovascular types of, of problems. And then those that, are, that live, live past those two challenges usually have a dementia of some type. Right, right. So those are the three biggies. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day, lifestyle has a huge impact, as we've just talked about, on, on each of those, whether it's the uh -huh. epigenetics of cancer the epigenetics of, of, um, of coronary artery disease, and we're obviously learning daily as to the different kinds of dementias because there's so many different kinds. It's, it's, it has, as we just talked about cancer, it's not one cancer, it's multiple cancers. What, what is absolutely exciting to me is that I actually think, and I, this may be naive and I may be overly optimistic, but I don't think so. I think now that we have, again, a relatively direct line of sight on a genomic inflammatory signature, mm -hmm. if we basically can prevent or certainly substantially reduce the cancer burden through cancer vaccines, which I know we can in dogs, so the chances of humans are about, again, 95%. If we can basically uh, harness the, again, the technology related to the inflammatory process inside the coronary arteries, uh, we'll basically probably be able to do that within the cerebrovascular arteries. So at least the ischemic types of events in the brain and the heart can be affected, which means as as as, her as heretical as this sounds, I think we'll have a vaccine for cardiovascular disease. I think that'll probably be 10 years away, but I think 
quite candidly, that's not so far fetched. And the real the real question for me is with the multiple types of dementia. How many of those different dementias have an immune signature of some kind? Will right. Alzheimer's have a de- different sign- signature than chronic ischemic dementia, for instance? Um, right. And I think they, I think we will see a difference. But well, I, I can't, I, I can't discount again what Ahmed's done and what what you've done, Ben, and that is amplify the epigenetic piece, which is the preventive piece, lifestyle piece that you right. talked about. Well, and, and I I know it's it's uphill. What I'm counting, but I like I said, I've seen progress, uh, and and I think uh, what what I'm hoping is that uh, as people suddenly awaken to the idea that because of these wonderful things we're talking about here, they could live a very long time, mm-hmm. and that they're, they're going to want to work. They're going to have to work a very long time, and you can't work if you're not if you're not in good enough health to go to work. And uh, and I'm hoping that'll begin to, you know, that's not a quick change, a quick reality, because people still don't save enough today for, you know, to finance their 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 latter years. So we're going to have to wake up to that kind of responsibility. But there's nothing like it than suddenly facing <laughs> facing it, which uh, people are increasingly doing. So uh, let me let me shift gears a little bit and ask you guys uh, to 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 shift to uh, to the patient contact side of this, because that's another thing. Uh, most of the people who are not, uh, that are listening uh, or watching t- uh, this uh, today, uh, I-, I think are probably not uh, terribly aware of how the population decline is impacting healthcare and how it's been being hit perhaps harder than any other industry and that we're losing clinicians at a time when an aging population and all these wonderful new therapies, we need all the clinicians at every level. So we need, uh, we need, we need docs, uh, specialists. We need nurse practitioners. We need, we need uh, nurses. We need non-clinical caregivers in the home. How, what? Can you what can you tell us about that, Jock? And then I'd love to get your thoughts on it as well, Ahmed. And before we go there, I want right. to, I want to piggyback on that question. Okay, please. Because I, uh, with everything everything Ben said, plus I want to know when will my doctor be a robot? <laughs> no, there, there you go. Why don't we you know, why don't we bring up the slide for a quick second? I, yeah, I, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I took the liberty of of kind of orienting. Uh, the delivery, at least, in terms of the different kinds of doctors and where different types of procedures get done. In the middle, we have a, a primary care doctor uh, circle. And as as we just articulated, even though there's shortages of everything, primary care doctors have been probably at the center of this challenge, even even before COVID and really within the last five years. We are, we are really trying to catch up um, as, as quickly as we can in terms of getting primary care doctors to be available. But I think what has changed, Ben, and, and, and I'm sure you have seen this, is that people in general in the healthcare delivery area have to work at their top of license. So it's not only the primary care doctor, that primary care doctor has an assistant, that assistant can expand the primary care doctor's scope of things, and for all intents and purposes, serve more patients than they otherwise would, and perhaps provide a better patient experience. And Jock, let okay. me hold you sure. and make sure I, we under, explain that term to our to our to our audience today. In healthcare, what happens is we often have used the term uh, for the longest I've been in healthcare. That one of the real shames is that our clinicians, at all levels, again, no matter what their job is, don't operate up to the top of their license. And what we mean by that is that. They have to, they perform tasks that doesn't require a nurse, that doesn't require a doctor. They're administrative tasks, they're, they're documentation tasks. And, and that takes uh, but somewhere between 15 and 30 percent of, of all virtually every clinician's time. Yes. A t- a time. So, so, one of the great opportunities of artificial intelligence. Uh, you, you, if you're, if you watch, if all you do is watch TV and read the news, you think it's the worst thing that's ever happened to humanity. Well, it's not. <laughs> and, 
and uh, at least uh, what the way we're going to apply it in healthcare. What we're going to try to do right off the bat in healthcare is have have those wonderfully trained people who spent some of them twenty years in in school and and in training do what they were trained for, and that's so that's a very very important part of how our, uh, how how technology will assist us. Go ahead. I I completely concur, Ben. And really, what it comes down to is that using some of the technologic interventions and and telehealth is probably a very good one. During right. COVID, nobody wanted to go see their doctor for all sorts of good reasons, such as you right. might be sitting next to someone with COVID, <laughs> which is not, which wasn't optimal at the time. So we went to something like 80, 90 percent of office visits in telemedicine. Yeah. Now the the pendulum has, sw- has, has swung back, and we're basically now at the 35 to 40 percent level. And I, I, you know, from a patient perspective, I will tell you. I, I go to see I go to see the doctor certain times for more complex issues. I don't go see the doctor for check-ins and quick visits. Uh, I, I think, quite frankly, the whole digital health platform or telehealth platform is going is in the process of being evaluated by each person as to how it works for you and your healthcare decision. And and Ben's point related to um, using AI uh, and, and your comment, Fred, about the about the robot. You can combine both of those, and there can be a robot taking your vitals. There can be a robot checking you in and, and getting the basic reason you're showing up for the visit. So at the end of the day, these technologic advances, while sometimes seeming a little bit impersonal, I think will ultimately end up, as we all get more comfortable, with a better patient experience than we would have had before. But that that's my humble opinion. Go ahead. Yeah, and I, and I think I think you're right, Jock, and 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 I would point out I think this is maybe one of the most important takeaways for our audience. You'll have a choice, right? You'll either have healthcare with AI, or you'll not have any healthcare, because we simply cannot uh, produce. That's not much of a choice, Ben. That's not. The, yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's it. I mean what yeah. your choice is. I, I I know, and that's what I'm saying. There is simply no way. To continue to provide health care to an aging population that now could live maybe longer than 100 years uh, with the clinical uh, uh, staff, we've got the clinical population we've got today. We have to increase their productivity and the fastest way to get there is through artificial intelligence. But it won't be, uh, you, you're not necessarily going to see the robot. By the way, you have robots working on you today if you have surgery. So, 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 uh, so, but it's not robot like, uh, you know, like R2D2. It's, 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 it's simply an assist to the, to the physician and the physicians are already in charge. And the other thing I think that's always we, something that's a good parallel to remember in healthcare for, for decades, we've been going, we've been, we've been trusting our lives to when we get in an airplane to, uh, to computers flying the plane. Guess what? They fly more safely than the pilots do by themselves. But at the same time, if we all went to the airport and they said, you got you got three choices of planes. You got a plane over here that only the pilots supply. There's no computer help at all. There's planes over here that uh, only the computer flies and, and, and you can have that one. Or you can have the one where the, the two guys work together. You know, the computer, we choose that one. Well, that's what we're talking. Mm-hmm. About. That's exactly the model we're talking about. Uh, let me, uh, Ahmed, uh, any thoughts uh, from your standpoint before I want to sh- switch back to Jock and let you finish that, uh, your your discussion of that chart? Any comments that you've got on anything we covered uh, We covered in that dialogue? But just very briefly, I mean, uh, as you know, I'm Canadian here, here in Canada. Our healthcare right. system is slightly different, but we're, right. we're seeing very similar trends. Uh, and uh, I think... Um, It'll be it'll be interesting to see where we land with telehealth. Um, mm-hmm. There's still we're still seeing kind of a growing demand for people are just gotten used to the convenience of right. not leaving their homes. Uh, we're seeing a growth in the uh, um, you know cons- patients just taking more control of their own health by ordering lab tests, right? Direct right. to consumer lab tests, and right. you know there's challenges with that in terms of how to interpret it and the actions, but. Uh, there's a lot of those kinds of things that I think it'll be interesting to to watch over the coming years. Yeah. So, Jock, I want to switch back to you because I, I, I and I, I'm really interested, Ahmed, in one thing you said that you're such a big country compared and and spark 
relatively sparsely populated compared to the United States. So do, how, how, how do you feel today about uh, the rural care uh, in, in Canada? Because you I would think you've got a much bigger challenge there than even we do in the U.S., and it's, it's a problem for us big time. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't say too much about the uh, the delivery of, of healthcare in those rural populations, but uh, I, because as a researcher, you know, I have colleagues that do work on uh, indigenous populations uh, and definitely things got easier with, you know, Zoom being available and other types of services that you can, you know, send questionnaires online right. and, just, you know, kind of the, the, um, uh, those remote populations just being, you know, wired now uh, and getting access to all this kind of information. So uh, there's been improvements in in that area. I think again, not just for healthcare delivery, but also from a from a research perspective. Right. Uh, so right. hopefully that continues. And, and Jock, I think we're uh, the way I want to pose this back to you with that chart uh, mm -hmm. is, which I is I think is fascinating. But we're we've been talking about scientific innovation. We've been talking about prevention and how ultimately, and with home diagnostics and aura rings and all kinds of things, we can be better patients, taking care of our bodies and and so forth. But 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 there's another revolution going on, and that's mm -hmm. in how we're when I, when when any of us go to see uh, uh, contact, have contact with the medical system, how that contact takes place and who we're going to see. T tell us about that and wh how that's going to change. Let's go ahead and put that slide back on because I think, Ben, you, you've hit the nail on the head again, as you always do. I talk about the front door, which is the primary care front door. Mm -hmm. But as we get into specialty care, what you see is the next circle. And then the third circle is exactly what Ben's talking about. It's what's called alternative care delivery sites. It, you're going to see increasing care delivery in your home. There are very sophisticated digital health platforms that allow 72 different biometrics to be evaluated by someone visiting you at home. And theoretically, relatively advanced types of monitoring can occur for very complex diseases, such as congestive heart failure and atrial fibrillation and, and all sorts of care that would require us to come in to the hospital or the doctor's office today. So more and more is going to be done in alternative care sites. You're also going to see more and more procedures done outside of the hospital. The hospital historically was where so many procedures were done, and they were done very well. The problem is, is that hospital real estate and size of hospitals and what needs to be done there, I think quite candidly doesn't match what has to be done there. So as a result, many doctors and even many hospitals are building alternative care sites because you just can't afford to build a full general care hospital for the kinds of care that we give today. So the type of care that happens inside the hospital, the type of care that happens in these alternative care sites are really the next generation, Ben, of, of what's going to happen in relationship to the transition of care by location and, and special. Yeah, and again, I think for our 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 our, um, you know, our, our audience, uh, we've all grown up uh, by with with hospitals being sort of the center of the healthcare system other than our primary. So like a primary care doc and the hospital, that's the way we thought of, and the pharmacy. Right. Uh, and that's kind of how we would have defined the healthcare. But we, we, one of the things that uh, is hard when in, in, when change accelerates is to accept that some of those models uh, in any industry weren't always around. <laughs> you know, they, they, we always, we bemoan when they're gone. You know, but but they weren't always around. So hospitals were pretty much a progress of the, I mean, a product of the mid uh, of the mid of the industrial age, and particularly in the middle of the 19th century. And they were they were a place that made it easier for doctors to see their patients. That was the fundamental idea. And things have changed a lot, as as uh, Jacques uh, saying here. And and it doesn't mean that there won't be a place for hospitals, but you're not going to, I think what Jock's saying is, you're not going to think of it like in the past. You're not going to think of primary care, hospital, and the pharmacy. It's now going to be many, many different alternative sites, including a lot of it in your home, 
uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of it uh, that's going to be. And, and a good example is if you've had any orthopedic surgery or any orthopedic problems, you probably didn't have, and certainly if you had surgery, you probably didn't have that done in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You went to uh, you went to an orthopedic clinic where the orthopedists are very good at what they do, and that's all they do. And if I can just break in for a second, yeah. Ben, if I yeah. can just because you guys are off on this beautiful vision, right? Of a digital environment in which so much of our personal health is going to be taking place, not in a hospital, not with a primary caregiver, but as we would say in the cloud, right? In the in the digital cloud, and and I was just wondering if you could all speak to maybe some privacy concerns. Uh, and what that's going to mean and what the ask is going to be from us. Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. And uh, uh, I would tell you that, uh, that first of all, uh, healthcare has greater requirements on it and should uh, than any other industry. So they've been working at this through, you know, probably everybody's filled out HIPAA forms, uh, you know, and, and so, the sensitivity to the data is much higher in healthcare than it is in most everything else you do, uh, and uh, and so we start out with that. But uh, but and also it it isn't necessarily all going to go through the cloud. There could be a lot of closed loop home systems that won't necessarily be cloud based. But I was at a, a conference on uh, on cybercrime the other day, and uh, and we'll we'll be battling this a long time because they have a lot of money uh, and they're going to battle us on everything. But at the end of the day, it's all financial for them. So they just cracking in for the fun of cracking in. They don't do that. They're cyber criminals. It's a cyber ind crime industry. And they look for where they can make the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, and today it's, uh, it's, it's ransoming. It's ransomware against hospitals and health systems. That's one of their so, favorites. So, so Jock, what, yeah, let me, let me amplify on that, Ben. You, you could not be more correct. Um, as you know, as you mentioned, I'm involved in, in a number of companies that have highly proprietary technologies right? and um, actually had the experience of having a foreign country, I'll, I'll be very transparent, it was China, who tried to steal <laughs> an earlier version of our mRNA sequencing machine. And, wow. and I, 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 you know, it, it's always abstract until something actually happens to you. Right. And and you don't think it's all that serious. But to be totally, again, uh, transparent, I couldn't believe that literally China would put up a foreign front company and literally go after a machine to send it back to China. We actually had to hire an Israeli cyber technology company to trace the file uh, a communication that went to Canada, then to Beijing from this particular machine because the file dynamics were so unique that that was the only thing that could be set in that manner. So I would I would just suggest that privacy in healthcare is by far of the general types of, of, of industries, one of the top. There, there, there's more privacy than almost anywhere else. Those healthcare companies increasingly are doing business with the US government. The US government has in many instances what's called an authority to operate. If you do if you do business with the VA, the Veterans Administration, or the DOD, the Department of Defense, many of these healthcare platforms have another layer of security, and that other layer of security is not by accident. It's for reasons I just articulated. Uh, our government is always concerned that someone is watching or could penetrate a variety of of different environments. So I I actually am more optimistic about healthcare than I am about you know, hacking into right. the hospitals, for instance, because that that's kind of a different animal. But at the same time, we can't lose the of the ball because you're always you're always trying to be vigilant. No question. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it is definitely the way uh, as if you remember uh, in my in my book, uh, Fred, uh, I talked about uh, how, you know, every innovation brings with it problems, every innovation. I don't care what it is. And it does it for a reason, I think. I mean, I think it's nature's quality control system. It says, hey, dude, you haven't got it right yet. Go back and work on it. <laughs> Click fix this. You know, and then we oh, we go fix it, and then we start forward again, and we get another one, and we have to fix it. And over time, uh, we get along, but I don't think we'll ever have uh, a, any system that isn't 
doesn't have problems to have to that, to address. And and today, uh, it, they they're always uh, magnified to be catastrophic. Uh, and some of them might be, but we we've, we've managed to get this this far for three million years. So I'm I'm optimistic we'll make it another million or two. Well, that was one of the things I I really loved about your perspective on this, Ben. Which is that you you know within all the technology and all the automation and all the innovation, you did not lose sight of that spiritual health, yeah. which uh, you know is kind of the the underbelly of this of this whole thing. And and I was just wondering maybe you could comment you or or um, Ahmed, perhaps in terms of uh, food and health and and a kind of a holistic perspective yeah. as. What we're going to be looking at as we move forward in terms of that kind of movement of, of, of you know, will the spirit come along with the body? Well, uh, if, if, if I, I, at least with the people I hope to influence, it will. But, uh, but uh, yeah, my, my sec, the, 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 the big picture of the book series I'm writing uh, is that we're, we're going to have a, a huge expansion of human capability. Huge that just comes from the integration of us with automation because suddenly we can do things that were impossible before. And, uh, and, and also that as, as it, it will allow us over time to, uh, to focus on a much higher quality work so that I don't imagine people in a declining population that we're putting all these people walking around without jobs, not for very long, because we need every one of them, and and I I tell uh, you know audiences that uh, I hope to look out my window someday and there are no landscapers. Uh, there's one guy out there with a joystick and he's doing everything. And all of those people who used to do work on my lawn how now now have jobs that are creative, problem solving, dealing with complex human relationships. That's the uplift. So I think we will. And 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 the other key piece of that is that I think we can accelerate wisdom and maturity using some of the very technologies we have. Uh, and, and, and wisdom at the end of the day is the art of living well. And the art of living well is mostly making good decisions. So, so if we focus in on helping people make better decisions, uh, we're going to have a better society and, a, and, a, and a, a, world, a better world society. So that's my dream. Ahmed, what do you think? Not well, about just, what I said, but what's your yeah. thoughts about it? Yeah. <laughs> no, just in terms of, uh, you know, that kind of holistic approach. And, uh, you know, I think of uh, some of the traditional uh, Chinese medicine and traditional Indian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, um, and how, um, you know, the, the different constitutions, as they described it in, in traditional Chinese medicine, which to some extent really refers to different genetic subgroups. Uh, right. And they've known this for such a long time. Uh, in fact, um, even as early as the first century BC, uh, Lucretius noted that, you know, one man's food is another man's poison. What's good for one person might be harmful to somebody else. Uh, so we've obviously come a long way and we could now use modern molecular genetics and genomics to pinpoint specific regions in the genome that can help us understand what works best for one person uh, over another, not only from, you know, the foods they consume for preventing various diseases, but once you right. have a disease and you need to be prescribed a, a treatment or medication, uh, the field of pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics also comes into play. Uh, drugs, you know, the best blockbuster drugs imaginable don't help everybody. They help most people, some right. people, they don't do anything. But then you have the adverse effects where they actually cause harm, greater harm in some. Right. So uh, those are, again, some of those uh, advances that I think we're going to see become more uh, used in more common practice every day. Uh, that's 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 wonderful. Uh, Jock, I want to shift something back to you and then uh, and then and then come back to Ahmed on it. Uh, uh, you know, and for the audience, I'm going to use a term that most many of you may know, but you may not know about, and it's called black swans and white sw swans. And, and what a black swan is, is some kind of event that turns out to be very negative. And we should have, in retrospect, we should have seen it coming, 
but we didn't. And that's not an, not something that's going to go away. It's it's an archetypal human behavior. We somehow miss the things that whack us really hard. COVID occur- is, is, is a perfect example. And then we look back and say, well, we should have seen that coming, but we don't. Uh, declining population. We've known for 50 years that the population, that we're having fewer uh, births, but we didn't do anything about it. Nobody paid any attention to it. And now we have people shortages we're trying to deal with. So that, that's kind of the black swan, but there's also white swans the same way. I bet every, I bet Jock has had one, Ahmed's had one. I've never met anybody who was, who, who, who d- could, didn't say, yeah, I don't really know how I got here. <laughs> I mean, there's these things that happen in your life and there's the things that happen in society that you can't explain how they got here, but they do. So here's a question for you, Jock, <clears throat> and then for you, Ahmed. <clears throat> if you had to guess, what's the biggest black swan risk, one or two, and what is the most likely white swan, something that's not on our agenda necessarily as big, but it could come out of nowhere and be, wow, transformative. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as succinct as I can because these are these are extremely uh, deep questions <laughs> that on, on a variety of levels. The black swan that I see, and quite frankly, I think we are all ignoring, is the fact that all of these wonderful interventions, technologies, creativity, mRNA vaccines, on and on and on, just the best of the best types of, of, of changes may very well not affect disparities in healthcare related to socioeconomic perspectives. So the social determinants of health, which I know you're extremely knowledgeable about and connected with, may not be affected by all of this wonderful of these wonderful advances. And that bothers me. Yeah. And I think that's an area we have tended to ignore and if we continue yep. to ignore it, it'll come back to bite us um, big time. I couldn't so agree more, Jock. And as you know, <clears throat> that was uh, why, uh, you know, my son Hugh and with you know, and I certainly was supportive and helped back him. Formed a company called Equality Health, whose sole mission in life is to close those disparities. That's that's why it's there. So, exactly. but, but we need we need a hundred Equality Health. Exactly. That that's yeah. my point. That's exactly yeah. my point. Oh, and and. We've talked forever about how much we spend on health care and how little we spend on health. And that health piece is right in that disparity area. I just want to make sure that everyone realizes that it's not only in the quality of health care, it's in how we uh, use the preventive pieces as well. The white swans, you know, I, 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 I have a very fatalistic approach on this. And Ben, I don't think you'll be surprised about what I'm going to say. I've been very <laughs> fortunate. I've been very fortunate in my life. I've been at many healthcare inflection points that have turned out well. One of them, several of them have been with you and, and others around this table. But but the bottom line is, is that if you're up at bat, they'll hit the ball. If you're not up at bat swinging, you won't know whether that ball is worth hitting or not worth hitting. So when you look at the inflection points, such as the development of, of high-performing health plans, such as Anthem, or the right. development of multi-billion dollar physician practice management companies that you normally wouldn't have been involved with. Uh, you, you, got, you got to keep looking at this. Right. The mRNA opportunity I talked about was seven years ago. It was three years before COVID. I had no idea whether, whether, why, whether mRNA was even going to be viable, on and on. So my point to the, the audience is that you have to kind of stretch yourself a little bit, not to do foolish things, but to do at the same time things that perhaps maybe take you out of your comfort zone that seem, you know, uh, absolutely rational five years later, but weren't rational seven years ago. So again, that's my yeah. comment. I, and, and, you know, uh, and uh, uh, Ahmed, would you like to comment? And then I'm going to close this. Uh, maybe it plays us up with this last one. Uh, no, I'll, I'll keep it brief. I mean, I think I, I echo Jacques' comments on uh, on the black swan, definitely health disparities. Uh, and for me, being in the field of nutrition and health, uh, specifically the area of, of uh, food insecurity, uh, there is no shortage of food. Oh, There's yeah. a tremendous amount of food waste going on. Uh, but at the same time, there are people who are not able to get uh, enough yeah. food, let alone good quality food to, to help right. prevent uh, conditions. So uh, that's, uh, again, I think the black swan and uh, the white swan, I, I don't know, that's tough. I think I'll, I'll just have to 
I think Jacques made a, a reference to baseball. I'll, I'll make my reference to uh, quoting Yogi Berra that uh, predictions are tough to make, especially about the future. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but yeah, and I want, I want to go, uh, close on this, uh, this one point. And, uh, uh, and I, I doubt it anyone in the audience today would disagree, but I'm sure you know people who would, or you may have uh, college students who, who would. Uh, we, we, when you look at the, and that's a big part of the, my book too, when you look at the arc of history and study it as long and as hard as I have for many years, you, you really realize it wasn't government policy anywhere it wasn't uh, even people of goodwill in most cases that changed the world and lifted society. It was innovation. It's always innovation. And innovation is so important. The United States is the greatest innovation engine in the world. And if you don't believe it, just go spend some time with people around the world. It's one of the reasons so many people hope to come here because they can move up in society on their by their own two hands and creativity, uh, and and that that we have an infrastructure here, but we have to protect that infrastructure. And so, people who suddenly want to have a great deal of government control, or they want to go after they don't they believe in socialism more than capitalism. You're looking at half the life. Imagine your life without capitalism, and you would have no printing press. We'd still be using leather books. Uh, you would have uh, you would have no uh, no uh, airplanes. All of that comes from somebody like Jacques said, going up to bat and saying. And what he meant by that was they put their money and their time in. They devote their career to something that may not work. And but if you don't, the world doesn't change, and it certainly doesn't change for the positive. So for me, that's a that is an absolutely essential thing for us to do is to preserve the ability to innovate better than ever. And, and the innovation comes from people's pension funds, a piece of that going into uh, an investment that, uh, that, that is higher risk, but offers a higher return. And that's how we fund these things. And, uh, and people like Jock and uh, others willing to put their, their own money uh, to create a better life for us. So we have to protect that above all. And I so, think we want to uh, have that be our closing comment the, all right. from somebody here who actually happens to love leather books. Um, <laughs> there is uh, clearly there is so much uh, so much more to say. Uh, but that's all for this session. Uh, we're going to have two more sessions. Uh, one of them is going to deal with the challenges ahead in healthcare, and the final session: What should you do becoming your own healthcare? advocate. Thank you so much for joining us and see you again soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody.